You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. On today's show, we sit down with Paul Helms, who's an independent technology professional with a focus on foreign startups coming to the U.S. With a specialty in the strategic management of intellectual property, his nearly 20 years of IP and technology licensing and management has given him a broad base in the nuanced complexities of developing and deploying intangible assets to the benefit of IP owners and users alike. Paul currently focuses on assisting startups from various European, Asian, and African countries, allowing him to see a wide range of opportunities that might make positive contributions to various markets in the U.S. and around the world. On today's show, we talk about what has been his experience with the pitfalls of Western money entering the African ecosystem and how much more advanced is mobile payments in Africa compared to the West. This and much more on today's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. And don't forget to like and share and write a review on iTunes to encourage us to create more content like this. All right, now let's start the show. Enjoy. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. Paul, thank you for taking the time today to be on the Silicon Valley podcast. I'm excited for you to be here. I mean, I've known you for years. I've seen a lot of your work helping startups, working at incubators, guiding government groups. The list goes on and on, but enough of me talking. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your backstory and your career up until this point? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Sean. Always happy to see you and the chance to talk about the work I do nowadays. I have a very diverse professional background. Most of my friends would say I can't hold a job. To some extent, they're right. But I consider that professional diversity to be a real strength when it comes to recognizing and solving problems. I've been in San Francisco a little more than 12 years doing pretty much everything in the tech ecosystem. I used to be the general manager of The Vault in San Francisco, which drew people from around the world. And I mean from all around the world, entrepreneurs, startups, investors, government folks, academics, you name it. But gave me a real, a really deep overview of what goes on in startups from all over the world, the things they do right, things they do wrong. And that's the kind of grounding that I'm nowadays trying to turn into advice, guidance, counsel, and a variety of activities so they can learn from my experience and avoid some of the mistakes that these startups make. As you know, people show up in Silicon Valley with a lot of preconceived notions of what goes on here, most of them not that accurate. So we try to provide reality checks to help them at least make fewer mistakes, if not actually make progress more quickly. And it's very gratifying work when it does work. Now, from my understanding, one of your passions right now, one of the areas you're working on is working with African Venture Fund. Can you tell a little bit about that, Sherry, what your experience has been? Sure. Africa came along and I didn't go looking for it, but over the last year and a half, I've had a great deal of engagement with about a half dozen countries in Africa. In 2019, I was in Nigeria and in Cape Town in South Africa at tech conferences, meeting people, teaching classes, both for startups and for investors. The energy, the enthusiasm, the talent are all palpable. I mean, there's a huge hunger for opportunity and for resources and the chance to show what they can do. As the old saying goes, talent doesn't recognize area codes or zip codes, but what they do lack is quality of opportunity like we have here. Everyone knows how much goes on in, in this part of the world. Africa doesn't have that yet. They do have activity. They do have small capital markets, certainly promising emerging markets, but it's not there yet. So we're trying to, to use our resources and our energy, to provide opportunity to worthy startups and to investors in Africa. So you mentioned the venture funds. I've been very lucky to meet some prominent GPs who run funds right now only in South Africa. They have engaged us, myself and my colleagues here in the Bay Area, to mentor their companies, their portfolio companies, not to become Silicon Valley companies, but to learn about best practices from here that would apply when properly adopted and adapted to conditions in their home country so that they can build a more solid foundation there and use that as a base for international expansion. In fact, we had five companies from a fund based in Durban, South Africa, that was here in January this year, just before the shutdown. And that was great. They were young, enthusiastic, worldly, but they'd never been here before. So we threw a lot at them, probably more than they could legitimately expect to consume in just two weeks. But they went back with a much broader base, not only of experience and exposure, but connections to myself and the 22 mentors that I brought into the program. So that's kind of a pop-up network of professionals in this part of the world that is unlikely they could have created on their own. So one of the real benefits of working with these funds, and I give them credit for being visionary about this, 
is not just the training, the mentoring, but it's the connections and the exposure to people around here who, well, if they're part of the program, they've got a demonstrated enthusiasm to help startups coming out of Africa. So it's been great. And we're now looking forward to expanding out of South Africa because there's lots of opportunity in all over the continent. There's 1.2 billion people, the definition of emerging market, but there's been some real successes there. We hope to help drive more of them. Five companies with the 22 mentors, what were some of the feedback from the mentors of areas that they were either surprised that, wow, these companies have way more going on in this area than we thought, or the opposite going, wow, they're really lacking in these certain areas, these certain parts? Well, every company had strengths and weaknesses, as all startups do. The best comment we got was from a friend of mine who happens to be an expat South African. He came to our demo day, and he's a member of a an angel network here. And he told me after the event, when the five startups presented, he said, these are better than any companies I'm seeing here in San Francisco, which I thought was assuming he was being honest. And I'm sure he was. That was a real compliment to us because we worked really hard. We really transformed these companies in two weeks. They lack the usual things that startups lack, which is a long-term vision, which is maybe relevant corporate experience to be good managers in addition to being good entrepreneurs. But for the most part, they were well chosen by the group down in Durban. And they came here with a pretty clear mandate, pretty clear mission. And all the mentors that I brought in knew what terms of engagement were. And they did a great job, not pushing too hard, but also holding them to account. So we feel like they got a sort of an object lesson in how to learn a lot in a very short time. So we probably overdid it. I would use fewer mentors with a longer engagement for each one next time. But they got their money's worth for sure. So the companies there, do they have accelerator programs or incubators for the companies when they start out, what do they have there right now? Well, that's a really good question. It varies country to country. The the more advanced economies, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, those have well-established infrastructures. They have capital markets. They have some precedent for promising companies growing and getting acquired or possibly even going IPO, but it's not evenly distributed. I did a a Google search. I think there are some 650 incubators and accelerators around Africa, continent of 1.2 billion people probably a lot less per capita than you'd have here, Western Europe, but that's still a lot of people. That's still a lot of talent being aggregated in these incubators and accelerators. I haven't gotten much sense that the university systems there do a lot. I know most universities in North America are pretty active in some form of entrepreneurship, encouraging it, teaching it, supporting it. So I think there's some, there's a lot of infrastructure to be filled in in Africa, but if there's 650 institutional forms of incubator accelerator, there's bound to be companies. One I know fairly well, is based in Cape Town. It's called Startup Bootcamp Africa. And it's run by two guys who are very accomplished entrepreneurs, investors, mentors. They run probably the most popular program in Africa. And they get a great deal of almost 2,000 applicants for 10 slots the second half of 2019. We've talked to them about, we'd like to work with your companies once they graduate from your program. Would some of them be appropriate to think about coming here and raising money here and setting up shop in the US? Same way we're approaching with the venture funds. It's all about finding what are the resources that can identify, filter, nurture those promising companies and spring them out into the world. Do you think there's a big appetite for Silicon Valley investors to invest in these African startups? I'll say not yet, not only because of relative unfamiliarity by Silicon Valley folk with what goes on in Africa. Most Americans aren't that familiar with Africa. And so we have a real market education task ahead of us. However, any good investor looks at the nature of the opportunity the risk profile and the de-risking that the startup managed to achieve to make a decision. Sure, there's unfamiliarity, there's distance between here and Africa. There are different tax, different regulatory regimes, certainly different business mores. And that unfamiliarity is not going to make them more comfortable at the outset. There is investment going to Africa from all over the world. Any investor here willing to give it a chance to listen to what could happen would have a chance to make a decision whether it fits their own risk profile or not. That's all we ask for is to be judged on the merits. We want eventually We want it not to matter at all that somebody is young or from Africa or a first-time entrepreneur. We want them to be able to stand on a par with any other startup from anywhere in the world and make a case that they're a worthwhile investment. You had mentioned an accelerator in Cape Town. How is that accelerator? Is it very similar to the models that are here? Maybe an investment for equity, a certain time frame, maybe 12 weeks. What's the structure of accelerator programs like there? It is very similar. In fact, they're a branch of a Dutch organization, Startup Bootcamp. And I believe they take 10 companies every six months. They make an an equity investment. They, I believe the program runs for six months and they have their own facility in a beautiful building in the heart of Cape Town. 
And it's a very deep engagement by the staff and the mentors with the startups. They've fledged a lot of great companies out of it. I'm not intimately familiar with it. I know the guys who run it and they're very, they'd be impressive anywhere. And so I think there's, if you get a chance to uncover opportunities like that, yeah, I think any investor here would say, boy, I'd at least like to know a little more about this. Whether or not it's for me, I can't say yet. But one thing I can tell you, valuation is a lot more favorable down there. And there's a lot fewer investors in the overall poking and pawing at these opportunities. So those who have a bit of extra risk tolerance or a desire to try something new could certainly do well in the more developed economies in Africa. And that's one of the things we're trying to do is make those opportunities visible to people up here. The companies that are coming out of these accelerators, kind of what areas of tech are they focused on? Well, that's a good question too. I think if you look at the, the majority or the distribution of tech focus of African startups, you're going to find a different mix, of course, than you would here. For example, mobile payments. Mobile payments in Africa are much more advanced than they are here, for example. Of course, the US is heavily regulated and you get some big players and a lot of resistance to change or the big guys want a piece of it before some startup comes along and, and takes it out from underneath them. So I think mobile payments have been slow to come along given the size of the economy here. But in Africa, of course, the mobile phone has been the dominant mode of communication and transaction longer than it has been here. They just don't have the infrastructure and the history of building these things up the way we have in the US, in North America and Western Europe, say. As one example of that, when I was at the vaults a couple of years ago, I hosted a Nigerian company called Paystack. We had a great event with about 100 expat Nigerians who came and visited with the company. The CEO and his team were here. And just yesterday, the announcement came out that they were acquired by Stripe for $200 million. Congratulations to them. That's a great outcome. $200 million in Africa is proportionally a lot larger than $200 million here. Good on them. But Stripe is also smart to get into the African market by acquiring one of the, the leading companies. Although I don't think they were one of the bigger ones. Well, I know when they were here two years ago, they weren't. They had processed, I believe, $45 million worth of transaction, which isn't bad, but even for Africa, that's not a huge number. So, but it does show there's M&A activity. You know, Stripe went there, picked them up and probably doing it, looking at other opportunities as well, but it's far from over. It is not a crowded landscape like it is here. What about other areas of technology, maybe ag tech or fintech? Fintech, but not the way we might normally think of it. You know, a huge portion of the African population is unbanked. I think 60% of people don't have bank accounts. Here, I'm guessing it's a much, much smaller number. And so you've got opportunities now with fintech platforms and better mobile communications to give them the, the equivalent of banking capabilities. There's bound to be a lot of those. I don't follow fintech particularly closely myself, but I know there are lots of startups in that area. I think, uh, yes, ag tech, of course, Africa is a big continent, a lot of desert there, very, very rural, very agrarian. I'm sure some of those are filtering out. A lot of mobility. I once did a pitch event. This is now three, four years ago. And it was by Skype from Lagos, Nigeria. There were five companies. Three of them were apps to tell you how to get across Lagos. That's pretty specific because Lagos is a nightmare of traffic and not just because of congestion, poor road quality, any number of reasons. It's quite a place. If you like high energy cities, you can't go wrong in Lagos. Three out of these five companies had taken on the exact same problem between buses, taxis, for all I know, bicycles to get across town. So it shows an immediate need and immediate solution that may or may not have been applicable to other big cities. You know, I'm sure Nairobi and, and Johannesburg have their own issues with traffic that might be equally applicable. So you're finding that kind of thing. There are some medical devices. I've met a medical device company coming out of, out of the University of Johannesburg. Probably all the same categories as here, but maybe a, it will be a different proportion. Like I say, mobile payments, mobility, fintech for the unbanked. Again, it reflects conditions on the ground throughout Africa. And of course, a small country like Lesotho, which is inside South Africa, as compared to Mali, which is gigantic, you know, you're going to have different needs and therefore different offer solutions. Speaking of the different countries in Africa, the company wanted to expand. Say one of these companies that just graduated from an accelerator program. Is the next market for them the US or is it other countries in Africa? What is the market expansion plans normally? Well, again, I'm no expert on Africa. I, I freely admit to knowing almost nothing. I've been there twice, but I'm not really, I'm not an expert in any way. I probably never will be. And that's okay. I know lots of people who are, and I'm happy to listen to what they have to say. I think when it comes to local, to regional, to continent-wide, and then internationally, it's going to depend very much. On, it's a case-by-case -case basis, for sure. I know when Paystack was here, they were looking at the landscape in the US to see, could they play in it? They decided at the time they couldn't. That was probably a good decision because now they've been acquired. But I think there are certain types of solutions that would be amenable to an outreach up here. I can tell you one of the companies we work with does a smart SMS marketing, which is not very common here. You know, if you get a text on your phone that's a marketing pitch of some sort, 
you're more likely to delete it as soon as you've read it. Well, this company, which is relatively new to the market down there, is doing $7 million in revenue this year. We'll do $7 million this year. Business has increased because of COVID. They are planning to come here, travel conditions notwithstanding, in 2021. So they have uh, dedicated funds for a repatriation from South Africa to San Francisco. And in fact, that's the kind of company that they've done their homework. They've built a solid base at home. They've raised money from a well-known venture fund specifically for the move to the US. And so we're, we've been engaged with them for the last three months. And it's been very successful because not only have we refined the way they talk about their value proposition to investors for here and anywhere else, but we've also taught them what's different on the ground here, what are some resources they could use to make better decisions when they come here or when they prepare to come here than when they actually arrive. One thing I haven't mentioned is a venture that I started with a guy named Mark White and the law firm White Summers in Redwood City. It's called Africa House. If you drive east on Jefferson Ave, just before you hit Veterans Boulevard, if you look to the right, you'll see a big white wall with the continent of Africa painted on it. And it says Africa House or White SpaceX, which is a venture that Mark started. Uh, Mark's a visionary in his own right. And we use that space. We used it when the companies were here in January. And we use it both physically and virtually for companies, for investors or academics or government folk who want to learn about the US, get exposure to what goes on here without necessarily setting up shop here on their own. So Africa House in Redwood City is designed to be a fully functional resource for anybody who wants to come here for whatever reason. And the other direction as well for American or other companies that want to learn about what goes on in Africa, where could they go to explore this, that, or the other? We can provide resources, connections, and some experience in how those things work. For learning about Africa, coming from the Silicon Valley mindset, what should someone know? Well, it's all about expectation, like most things. Entering any new market is full of risk, although Going from the U.S. to Canada is one thing. Going from the U.S. to Ghana would be a different one altogether. It's impossible to do too much homework when it comes to understanding what the market conditions are like for whatever you play in. Understanding the competitive landscape is huge. Understanding taxation and and banking rules are really important because you're going to be dealing with that regardless. Understanding employment law. A lot of companies get surprised when they hire somebody, say, in Germany, and they decide they don't like them anymore. It's not you don't just fire them, right? There's a whole different way of doing business over there. So you've really got to know these things. I think a lot of folks take for granted that the rest of the world thinks like we do here. The rest of the world does not think like we do here. And that's, some people think of it as a Silicon Valley arrogance. I think it's just not paying attention. You should know, anybody who's traveled even once will know that things are different in other countries. That applies every aspect of doing business in some African country. Some of them would be similar enough, you know, whether it's language barriers or negotiation style, you just got to do your homework. But I think there are lots of resources out there, people and, and resources that we know, but there's no shortage of other, other places to go to look for information. There's consultants. There's lots of government information. Take it in, decide what makes sense for you, and act accordingly. But don't just go in there blindly. You will get burned for sure. You'd mentioned a company raised VC funding specifically for coming to the U.S. to set up operations. How much funding is available for these startups? Is it mostly just VCs, or are there a lot of individuals investing in companies, or is it government investment? Where is some of the money coming from? to start these companies? Well, like here, there is a mix of funding sources. There are angel networks, although they're not nearly as robust as they are here. And in Europe, it hasn't emerged yet. There's not enough precedent. Bit of a catch-22. How do you demonstrate to medium or high net worth individuals that these are risks worth taking until enough people have taken that risk? So the angel networks are pretty weak. Been my experience. I'm sure others have have other experience that might uh, countermand that. I think on the venture side, there are some very successful funds, Knife Capital, is a very well-known one. We work with a couple, Kalon Ventures and IDF Capital, that are run by very, very accomplished, very dynamic GPs, and they've got great portfolios. And we're, we're really pleased that they think enough of us to work with us and to provide useful guidance to their companies. We also think that we can do a lot to channel resources from here, whether virtually or when they come here in person, to put them in front of investors to show opportunities that are worth pursuing. I'd say venture is probably the most common source of money. There is government money, but like governments everywhere, it takes forever to get, comes with lots of strings. Usually there's a timeline mismatch. A startup needs money in the next three months. And the first round of applications take three months just to get going. So I think there's, like most places, governments are not really suited to the needs of startups and companies that might be in growth mode. It's just, there's just a mismatch there. At the top end of the scale, private equity money has had a bit of a field day in Africa. There was a story last week about some nightmare stories, private equity firms from the West, the US and Europe coming into Africa and just taking advantage of companies there, gutting them, saddling them with debt, and then 
well, good luck. It's not the only place it happens. And I'm no expert on the topic. I think it's always buyer beware or seller beware. If you get an offer that seems too good to be true, it almost certainly is, whether you're in South Africa or South Carolina. And I think that's, there's a lot of good lessons from looking at the trends in investment from different sources over the years. But it's still early days in the African investment scene. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. What about with nonprofits? Is that a way to get money for these companies? Here, of course, nonprofits are highly regulated. So it's, that's a different kettle of fish. Down there, there's lots of aid money available. And that might be maybe indirectly convertible into some kind of play or some kind of resource base to grow a startup. You know, there's lots of things to help with prenatal care and child vaccinations and basic infrastructure, light and water and things like electricity, things that haven't really evolved there the way they have here. I would guess that the nonprofit landscape, the aid, whether it's aid from private organizations or governments or you, you know, USAID or the Gates Foundation, the bigger philanthropies that specialize in emerging markets, it's going to be a pretty broad spectrum of access, simplicity of access to that money, but I probably wouldn't count on it. Again, I'm guessing the turnaround time from application to receipt of funds is too long for most startups to tolerate. I would wonder what the screening process would be like as well, the nonprofits, because if it is not re- really that regulated, I'm kind of curious how they would make their decision. Well, I've worked with several nonprofits over the years in the emerging markets, although never in Africa. What we always found is that promises of accountability, actual accountability, there's often a gap between the two. They just don't have either the, maybe the habits or the infrastructure there to track the money the way it's expected here. You know, an American nonprofit that raises money from the Gates Foundation understands the stringent rules that apply to that money, how it's going to be used and how it's going to be accounted for. That's just harder to do. Remote area of a, of a giant African country where there's little communication. It's just harder. I give credit to any philanthropy that takes a risk on part of the world where they can't expect the same type of treatment of their money. You know, give them credit for taking a risk. That's just the way the world works, right? Can't have everything everywhere. If conditions in Africa were the same as they're here in the US, it'd be a much different world. Africa is up and coming, make no mistake. There is no doubt. Lots of opportunity. Then how does one of these startups obtain resources, the resources that they need? I mean, it sounds like it's just kind of difficult overall. <laughs> I would say that I've, met, I've met people who are absolute masters of bootstrap. I mean, they really make the most of very little resource. Uh, so they're good at that. And that's, that goes a long way in any startup. You know, bootstrapping is a fundamental element of any early stage company, no matter where you are, certainly. I don't know enough of them. Their, their stories well enough to say that friends and family is, plays a bigger part or that maybe there are angel networks, but they're just not publicized. Therefore, we don't know about them. And I don't know the number. I don't know the numbers in terms of, say, university graduates in engineering and computer science translates into X number of startups around those technology areas as it would be around here because you Stanford and Cal and all sorts of other things that crank out lots of people who have access to lots of resources. Again, it's that notion that talent doesn't respect area codes, but opportunity does. And you just don't have the opportunities there that you have here. So I'd be curious to see, someone's brought that data together, I'm sure of it. So I'd be interested to see, that's part of our learning curve too. I mean, we're still on a very, very steep learning curve. We're open to anything that changes the viewpoint we have, because we know that being so early in the game, that we, we have a lot to learn. But we also know the people we've met and the opportunities we've seen certainly justify more of the same. We feel no, we're not intimidated at all by the strangeness of Africa as a whole in the way businesses are run there and the way they're grown as compared to what we're used to here. If you're the Silicon Valley investor, you want to go there and find companies. How do you go about building your network? We, we did it by going there. We were lucky to know some people uh, in Nigeria and South Africa who were very gracious hosts, put together big events where we met lots and lots of people. And there's a great hunger for people there to meet foreigners coming to their country to show interest in it. It's still a human contact kind of world for all the virtual and digital capabilities we have. It's still a person-person world. Now, of course, it's a lot more difficult, but you can do a lot. You can still do a lot. There are lots of conferences that you can go to. And I think over time, people will become more habituated to using virtual platforms as a way to meet people. Or LinkedIn is a force everywhere. And you've got other platforms that, that, will be, that will emerge as better ways to meet people. More specific interests, trade associations presumably bring together practitioners from around the world and assume a greater importance now that everything is digital. Call us. I mean, we, we're happy to make referrals any way we can. We share anything and everything we know with anybody who wants it because we, we take no ownership of anything that we own. What we take ownership of is the responsibility to promote with proper cautions what it's like to do business in Africa or anywhere, anywhere else that we work. You mentioned before that there's kind of been some experiences where private equity groups have come into Africa. What have you seen? What have you heard? 
Well, I mentioned that article that I read. Okay, it's one data point. It was uh, posted by someone who gets a lot of respect on this African investor group. I've seen it happen here. We've all seen it happen here. So it's no surprise that it would happen there. Again, without knowing the specific details of these deals, it's hard to say. Any place where there's opportunity, you're going to have folks who go in with good intentions and not so good intentions. And I, I know a lot of folks look at private equity as basically a, an elaborate get rich quick scheme for the few who are in charge of the resource. I don't know much more about it. I, I probably shouldn't say too much more. I'm not an expert in any way. All I know is what people have told me they've gone through. So like everything else, buyer beware. If a deal looks too good to be true, it almost certainly is. So do your homework, do your diligence and act accordingly. What are some of the pitfalls then of Western money entering the ecosystem? We get that question a lot, actually, because it's mostly about expectation misalignment. You know, here people have a certain expectation of investment and return, or they expect an entrepreneur to be able to outline their vision of investment and return. And in Africa, there's a lot, there's different types of uncertainties. There are different types of obstacles and risks. And therefore, it's hard for people here to judge them and to model it out within their own heads or on a spreadsheet of how that's going to change the way the returns they expect. So I think unfamiliarity with the way things work in South Africa, for example, would make it really difficult for an investor here to, if they use the same reasoning and the same modeling techniques that they use for startups here, they're probably going to be disappointed. If they take the time to talk to their peers, to fellow investors, talk to some companies that have raised money and seen how it's gone, they can certainly modify their views and have a better understanding of what a particular company in a particular technology at a certain stage of development could offer in terms of investment and return. It's always buyer beware, whichever side of the transaction you're on. So I think it has to do with being willing to modify our expectations here into what's different down there, anywhere in the world, certainly not just Africa. So with that, can you share a couple of stories of your experience in Africa? I was in uh, Lagos June of last year. We were at a conference organized by our colleagues and it was great. It was probably a thousand people in a building at one time. They had asked me to teach a, my diagnostic bootcamp. It was a condensed version, just two hours of here's how you go about stating your case for value in a startup that you're trying to run. They had organized it so that they were going to be, they were going to basically auction off 40 slots uh, to sit in my class. And they said, well, that's I came all this way. I don't want to just talk to 40 people. I want to talk to as many people as want to learn. The MC said, well, I got this. And the MC was kind of a showman. So he's out there and he said, okay, number one. And he would ask a question. If somebody answered it, they got the ticket. And then number two, and I'm thinking to myself, we've only got two hours. You're eating into my time here. And he's number three. I went to him and I said, could, you, could we maybe just pick 40 people out of there? He goes, no, I'm going to do it this way. And I thought to myself, well, I'm only here once. I'm not going to waste this opportunity. So I said, can I see your mic for a sec? So I took his mic and I said, any woman who wants to be in this course, please come to the front of the room. We had legitimately a stampede. Probably 200 women jumped up from the audience and the people behind me, the organizers, they were screaming, no, no. So I caused a stampede and they came up and the guy looks at me and he said, now what have you done? I said, let me talk to these people. Let me give them what they're here for. It doesn't cost anything. I'd love to talk to this many people. It'll be a different type of class. So that's what we did. We ended up totally scrapping this idea of making it exclusive because we're all about inclusivity, caused a stampede. And in fact, one of the organizers, I'm working with her again on a new project, a new accelerator that I'd like to mention in a minute in Mauritius. And we were on the phone the other day and I said, Hey, remember the stampede? And she's like, I will never forget it. <laughs> so, but that just goes to show the hunger and the enthusiasm they have anybody to listen to them or to try to convey something useful to them. So that was a great time. You have to follow up with another story. <laughs> one of the things I'm working on now is a great initiative coming out of Mauritius. Do you know where Mauritius is? I didn't either. It's an island about 200 miles off the East coast of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean about as far from San Francisco as it's possible to get. I think if you go past it, you're on your way home. Mauritius is like the Delaware of Africa. They've got a very favorable tax regime. And so every corporation, every venture fund sets up a version of a C-Corp in Mauritius. So I got a call a few weeks ago from my Nigerian friend and her colleague. They're starting a new incubator accelerator slash, I don't want to say like a finishing school, starting and finishing school for startup. It's called Future Females Invest. And it's designed to attract female founded startups, not exclusively females in the company, but founded by women uh, throughout Africa to match them with capital, to nurture them from the earliest stages up to some inflection point, maybe getting their initial products to market or finding their first customer, or at least getting them ready to present to investors. And so they asked me to help structure this program. And I said, well, I'll happily do that. So I have a phone call this coming Monday night at 11 p.m. It's 11 hours later there. It's 10 a.m. 
on Tuesday morning in Mauritius, they've got 20 government people coming in to talk about what is this going to be? You want to get accredited. Well, what are you doing that deserves accreditation? They've asked me to get on the phone and to present like a Zoom call to talk about here's what goes on in Silicon Valley that we can convey to the participants in programs throughout Africa who will be there both virtually and literally. They want people to move to this island, coast of Madagascar, to engage in startups, but to basically to resettle. So it's a combination training, startup training, economic development, and resettlement into the island they call the island vibe. I think that's a really unusual way to structure an accelerator program, but that's what they're doing. And I'm pleased they've asked me to help out with it. I'm happy to do so. Now, if you were to move to anywhere in Africa, where would you move? Everyone says you got to go to the Stellenbosch, which is the Napa Valley of South Africa, about an hour north of Cape Town, as I understand it. I've never been. I've seen lots of pictures. If I had to, So that's the only place I've heard of that everyone says you got to go there. I have a sense of adventure. I would certainly try Nairobi. I would I'd try a city. I wouldn't want to move some rural area. I wouldn't really know what to do in a place like that myself. I've heard great things about Abidjan and Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. Of course, it's a French-speaking country, and I don't speak a lot of French, but I'm sure I could learn. So I'd say Nairobi, maybe Accra is supposed to be great in Ghana, I believe. Cape Town's great. Everyone raves about Cape Town, legitimately so. Johannesburg, maybe a little less. I'd say Cape Town, Nairobi, or Accra, or Abidjan. Those would be my four that I know. Although I talked to a woman from Morocco. Morocco sounds, I've always thought Morocco is interesting. You know, what's Marrakesh or Fez or Casablanca, kind of mythical names. I would say that that list of five would be the top. Uh, One city from each of those countries would be it. Just to see. It's bound to be an adventure no matter what. And what do you think lies ahead in the startup ecosystem for 2021, 2022? Well, the big picture, meaning the state of the world and our ability to travel and, and not be in fear of our lives, I, I guess I'm a little pessimistic on 2021. I don't see, at least in the US here, I don't see much changing given the way things are going with spikes in the numbers of coronavirus cases and uncertainty and fear and lack of leadership. These are pretty big impediments to anything going back to whatever the new normal is because it's not going back the way it used to be. I'm sure of that. The inability to travel, although it's, in my case, monumentally inconvenient, also forces us to be clever, to be focused, to stop complaining about what used to be and start looking forward to what what will be. And I think for 2021, it's going to be more adaptation like we're doing now. So I feel like we're all in the same boat, but we're not sure what the boat actually is. So I think 2021 is going to be a pretty tough year as well. Hopefully by 2022, there'll be vaccines, there'll be enough realization by enough people that wearing masks and getting vaccinated and observing proper protocols around minimizing disease transmission will take hold. Until that happens, I think we're going to be stuck in this virtual separation, literal separation with a virtual connection that we have to find ways to maximize the value of any contact we make. But I think people have already gotten pretty good. I've been to a bunch of online conferences and festivals, so recreation stuff, business stuff, and you know, they're not bad if you take it seriously and you're willing to wade through a slower process. It can be done. We don't have any choice. Simple as that. We don't have any choice. Well, where do you think there's going to be opportunities in all this? I think opportunity is now where it used where it was before. The needs are still the same. I think there may be things you reprioritized. I'm working with a new tech fund, starting to assemble, we're assembling a value proposition to raise a fund for ed tech because education is the key to everything. The digitalization, the virtualization of education was well underway before 2020. Now it's the norm completely. I mean, who knows what's ever going to happen with schools in the future, whether K through 12 or universities or whatever situation. We think there's a ton of opportunity there. So I'm, I'm pleased to be part of that effort as well. I think there's going to be, it's hard to say really, because things change so rapidly on the ground here that lots of people come up with lots of new solutions. That's the essence of entrepreneurship anywhere. But of course, in Africa, we have different conditions, different needs, different resources. The solutions will look a lot different. I think the important thing is to be able to identify a solution that you understand well enough to decide whether or not it's something you want to get engaged with or not as an investor, maybe as a customer, a supplier, a vendor. I think opportunities are everywhere around the world, but you really need to do your homework outside your home market. You got to do it in your home market too, of course. It's just an added layer of complexity and unfamiliarity in a place like a country in Africa. Prior, you were the general manager of the vault. What do you think is the future of incubators, especially with COVID? I think incubators play a more important role than ever because you need to find ways to train people. Again, education is everything. And incubation is really a form of education as much as anything else. Learn what works, learn how to recognize problems, how to solve them, know when to say when, have the judgment to say what we're trying just isn't working. We got a little bit of money left. Let's not just throw good money after bad. 
And I think incubators, because they're now, I say virtually all virtual, uh, they have a long, maybe have a longer time frame. You can do more over a longer time frame, as long as people have the right expectations about the time it takes to incubate companies from whatever level of maturity to whatever new level of maturity and functionality and operational efficiency. There's a lot of things to be learned about how to create the content, how to convey the content, how to teach people how to learn. And I've done a lot of startup bootcamp classes and I really enjoy them, but I start every class by saying, you are here to learn. That the slides I'm going to show you on the screen have a lot in them by design. You're not expected to know, know it all today, but I encourage you to take it home and refer to it every once in a while. There's a lot in there you need to know. So I think we need to reemphasize the value of learning and the rigor and the discipline to learn new things, keep them in mind, and to apply them when situations demand. Too many actions that don't appear to reflect what ought to be a pretty basic level of understanding of the problem they're trying to solve. A lot of knee-jerk reactions or just doing something because we've always done it. And there's no worse reason to do something than habit. There's a lot of ways we can learn and teach people how to learn that will make a fundamental difference in the way companies grow in the future. So I think incubators need to assume the role of a parent, of an educator, of a mentor, of a disciplinarian, and, but eventually of a coach, a pep rally leader to launch them into the world with the right skills and capabilities to succeed because that's all we can expect to do, but it's essential. It's got to be done right. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of that. Now you'd mentioned a little pep rally, get people out in the world. Have you noticed any... I've interviewed two people recently and they both talked about startups mindset and pull that this is all taken on founders in the startup community, the uncertainty, everything changing on a whim. Have you noticed anything similar with your global work? Not yet, at least not out of the African countries that I work with. About a half dozen at the moment. I see no, no reduction in enthusiasm or unwillingness to try. Granted, I'm just one data that's a relatively few, call it 25 or 30 companies that I've dealt with during the pandemic, enough to know how they look at the opportunities ahead of them. They all say, how do we make this work? Not, man, I can't wait till it gets back to normal. Now, I'm sure if you look around here and you do a sample of a thousand startups, you'll find a spectrum of reactions. But I think in general, a startup, a founder and a founding team that doesn't have the attitude of, we've got to make this work, we're going to make this work, is not a startup you want to be involved with. So this is sort of a stress test. It's a non-market force that is really putting startups to the test. And this is a chance for founders to show their real stripes. Can, do they shut down? Do they expand? I mean, this might be a great time to go after you know, what they call aqua hires, go out and acquire an engineering team or a sales team or whatever, just because the company they work for now is in trouble and they might be available. This is a chance also for growth, not just hunkering down and hibernating until the worst passes. The worst may pass, whatever that really means. It's not like the sky is going to clear and you're back in the same place you were before. It will be a different world. So if you're not tracking it as it goes, I think you're risking a huge downside when it finally does calm down a bit. And is there anything else that you think our listeners or should know or that you'd want to mention to our listeners about what you're working on, anything to do with Africa, any key takeaways? Depends who you are. If you're an investor and you're here in the, in the Bay Area, you see a lot, but there's an awful lot of people looking for the opportunities. So the signal to noise ratio is all wrong for most investors here. Unless you're one of the top tier firms, you're going to be fighting, in a way, fighting for scraps because valuations will be maybe out of hand by the time you get a crack at something. So don't be afraid to look at emerging markets. I mean, I was in Romania a year ago and it was awesome. Romania has all the things that a startup ecosystem needs. They have smart people, they have good English, they have good technical education, they have some capital markets, and most importantly, they have a collective desire to have a bigger impact in the tech world at large. They also have really good valuations and really good internet access. Their internet access puts ours to shame. Don't be afraid to look at places that are not traditionally considered tech hotbeds or the sources of opportunities that don't insist on it being a unicorn. As I often tell people, a unicorn is an imaginary animal that disappears on the market whim. Give me a donkey, a solid donkey that, that's a real animal you know, that does 30 or $40 million a year and can carry a heavy load uphill quarter after quarter. That's the kind of company worth investing in at a certain point. So I think having the right expectations, not being afraid of novelty or unfamiliarity is really important. A willingness to listen. A lot of folks don't really like to listen. I've certainly been guilty of that at times. But I think the more you learn to listen to others, the more you'll find opportunities. You'll be able to recognize opportunities in places that you wouldn't have seen before. And that's a tremendous outcome. Whether or not you actually act on it or not is almost secondary to the fact that you, you now know it's there. It might not be for you, but it might be for somebody you know. So don't be afraid to share information about that. That's the idea behind Africa House. How do we aggregate and disseminate information 
to as many people who might benefit from it as possible. Because in our mind, there isn't nearly enough attention being paid to Africa. So we're going to do our part. Hope we inspire others to do the same. If they do, great. If not, well, then not. But we'll keep at it no matter what. And if anyone wants to find out more information about you, what you're working on, what's the best way to go about doing that? There's a lot of traditional ways to go about it. I give you my email address, not my phone number, although I know you have it. They can look up Africa House at the white, just look up White Summers. That's the law firm. And there's an Africa House page on that. We're, we're developing a social media presence for our still nascent consulting effort with these Af- South African venture funds. It's happened so quickly. We haven't put together all that. We haven't needed to just yet, but we will. If they contact you, you can refer anybody to me that might contact you through the program. All right. And with that, if you'd like to contact Paul Kim's, email me, Sean at the Silicon Valley Podcast.com and take a picture of the review that you wrote on iTunes about this podcast episode uh, before I make that intro, just so everyone gets a, a win win out of it. And with that, I have to say, Paul, thank you for taking the time on the Silicon Valley Podcast. Thank you, Sean. It's always a pleasure to be here. Appreciate the effort you make to spread the good word about Africa. Thanks again. And let's do this again someday. Perfect. Thank you for listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. To access our resources, visit us at the Silicon Valley Podcast.com and follow our host on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Sean Flynn SV. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is licensed by the Investors Podcast Network. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. 